In October 2019, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un ordered the demolition of the world's first floating hotel docked in North Korea. The hotel is currently owned by a South Korean company that bought it from a Japanese one. It was a major hit in Vietnam, but it was originally made for Australia, designed in Sweden, and built in Singapore. Traveling over 14,000 kilometers around the world, the hotel has experienced cyclones, fire, World War II ammunition, and a murder. This may all sound confusing to you, so let's start at the beginning. In the 1980s, Doug Tarka, the town developer of Townsville, and his son Peter Tarka wanted something unusual and innovative to attract tourists to their city. Townsville is a city in Australia located near the famous Great Barrier Reef. Hailed as a natural wonder, the Great Barrier Reef is the world's largest coral reef system. The unmatched beauty of the life under the seawater brings millions of tourists from around the world to this area. The original plan of Doug Tarka was to permanently moor three cruise ships along the city coast to create a safe anchorage on the reef, but this plan was later rejected as being too impractical. They then came up with another brilliant idea. They would build the world's first floating hotel. Now I know what you're thinking, we already have floating hotels, they're called ships and they've been around for centuries. But Doug Tarka didn't want a ship, he wanted a floating hotel. He believed that you could tell the difference when you see one. The floating hotel would be 7 stories high, 90 meters long, and its width would be shorter than that of a typical cruise ship. Unlike a ship, it would not propel on its own, rather it would sit still on the seawater and could occasionally be moved from one place to another using a carrier ship. A Swedish company designed the hotel and the construction began in Singapore at a company that built offshore living quarters at oil rigs. The hotel building costs came with a hefty price tag, estimated to be up to 20 million US dollars, and adjusted for inflation around 42 million in 2020. Upon completion, the innovative hotel was towed all the way from Singapore to Australia for its grand unveiling. A massive heavy lift ship carried the hotel more than 4,000 kilometers to its destination off the Australian coast. After arriving, it was connected to a number of anchors to stop it from floating away. The floating hotel was named the Four Seasons Great Barrier Reef Resort after the names of two stakeholders, Four Seasons and the Great Barrier Reef Holdings Limited. The hotel sat over the John Brewer Reef in the open sea some 70 kilometers off the coast of Townsville. From a distance, it looked like a seven-story building was resting on endless seawater. As you come closer, you could see that the hotel was much more than just a giant building. It was a world-first attempt to have people staying on the reef in a floating hotel. The hotel building was decked out with all of the typical in-hotel luxuries, including 200 lavishly furnished rooms along with a glowing neon nightclub, discos, bars, a gym, a sauna, a library, a 100-seat theater, a conference center, and a helipad. Want to play tennis on the surface of an ocean? The hotel has a floating tennis court. Fancy swimming in fresh water while surrounded by the endless seawater? The hotel even has a freshwater swimming pool. The hotel was the perfect place for diving, fishing, and other underwater exploration. Guests could also submerge themselves in underwater adventures with the use of the hotel's submarine. Other fish spotting opportunities came in many forms. Guests could jump straight from a platform into the sea for a casual mid-ocean swim, while glass-bottom boats allowed for low-stress views of the ocean's residents. The hotel also had an underwater viewing area where visitors could feast their eyes on fish without ever leaving the hotel. The hotel was surrounded by colorful coral, which the area is famous for. Other creatures and critters in the area included giant clams, reef sharks, blue starfish, and a whole range of fish. For those interested in tasting the delectable delights of the Seven Seas, there were two restaurants in the hotel with plenty of fish on the menu. Diners had the opportunity of tasting some of the freshest fish around. From the look of it, the hotel was one of the best things that happened to coral reef tourism in the area, but only on paper. In reality, the hotel was a disaster, to say the least. The Great Barrier Reef Resort looked good on paper, but it had gotten into hot water right from the very beginning. First, a contract dispute with the Singapore shipbuilder 
delayed the delivery of the hotel for over six months, and when it did finally arrive in Australia, Cyclone Charlie struck and 62 mile an hour winds buffeted the seven story luxury hotel. The damage was minor, but the hotel couldn't be opened until March of 1988. The delay cost the owners millions of dollars in lost revenue and cancelled tickets, as the hotel missed the lucrative North Hemisphere winter tourist market. With reduced prices and the hype around the novel concept of a floating paradise, the hotel opened with a good 85% occupancy. Even then, all these unusual attractions came at a hefty fee. One night in the hotel could cost anywhere from $550 to $1,100 per room. A major reason for the high prices was the unusually high operating cost of the hotel. A typical cruise ship travels from one place to another, exploiting local laws and loopholes to keep the operating cost low. This wasn't possible in the case of the floating hotel. Situated in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, this hotel had to measure up to the strict environmental standards to protect the sea life surrounding the complex. There was no toxic paint on the hull, and no waste was discharged into the surrounding water. Instead, all sewage and liquid waste were treated before then being dumped many miles outside the reef. Trash was all incinerated before being transported back to the mainland. Below the main deck of the hotel, a watertight compartment housed sewage treatment machinery, incinerators, diesel generators, a huge air conditioning system, a desalination plant that could produce up to 152 tons of fresh water a day, and a repair shop. The repair shop was capable of repairing anything from generators to handbags. The hotel even had a lab where marine researchers studied seabird droppings to make sure the hotel wasn't feeding scraps to local birds. Because of these measures, the hotel was thought to be completely unharmful to the environment surrounding it. The hotel was anchored some 70 kilometers away from the coast of Townsville, and the only way to access the hotel was via water taxis, which would ferry guests from the shore all the way to the hotel's entrance, in a journey which took 90 minutes and cost $120. Alternatively, richer guests could take the quicker and more luxurious 20-minute helicopter jaunt that cost $325. Rough weather often disrupted these journeys. If choppy water, high winds, or bad weather struck, it often would become difficult for boats and helicopters to undertake their trips. Visitors would often cancel their trips because of bad weather, and even those who could make it complained about high turbulence and seasickness. In August of 1988, one of the taxis caught fire and the passengers were seriously injured. The main selling point of the hotel, the Coral Reef site, was also a little strange. Between 90 to 95 percent of the coral in the John Brewer Reef had already been eaten up in the preceding five years. Two invasions of the Crown of Thorns starfish had gobbled up the vast majority of the coral. Furthermore, guests who didn't do scuba diving or snorkeling often complained about the lack of live entertainment in the hotel. The widely marketed swimming pool was long gone in a cyclone attack. The final nail in the coffin came in the form of World War II ammunition. In September 1988, some scuba diving guests found 100 tons of World War II ammunition, including anti-tank missiles, only three kilometers away from the hotel. The Navy investigated and claimed that the ammunition was just far away enough not to pose a threat. Apparently, until around 1950, it was legal to dump live ammunition offshore. Such news put a permanent dent on the reputation of the resort. Who would want to spend their vacation floating over a huge arsenal of World War II ammunition? To hold visitors, the hotel reduced prices even further, to only $130 per night for a double room. The enterprise also suffered from a bitter feud between the owners and the operators, poor management, hapless marketing, and eventually bookings began to dry up. During the final few months, the hotel registered only 20 to 25 percent occupancy. Due to this loss of money, the hotel needed to sail to more affordable waters. The hotel owners sold the hotel to a Japanese company in 1989, only a year after the hotel had opened its doors in Australia. These new owners transported the hotel to Ho Chi Minh City in the south of Vietnam. 
At that time, Vietnam was experiencing a post-war tourism boom. Ho Chi Minh City was flooded with foreign visitors, but the city didn't have many high-class accommodations for rich people. As an already packaged, ready-to-go facility, the floating hotel seemed perfect, so the new owners were willing to take the gamble. The journey from its Australian port to Ho Chi Minh City was another epic adventure of over 5,000 kilometers. Upon its arrival, the hotel was moored in the Saigon River, renovated to give it a local look, and renamed the Saigon Floating Hotel. The place was ready for its second life. In Vietnam, the Saigon Floating Hotel became an instant hit. The country's first foreign-invested hotel offered a range of luxurious facilities, services, and 400 highly trained staff. In 1995, the hotel charged up to 335 US dollars per room per night, in a country where the average person earned less than $350 per year. In its stay of more than nine years, the Saigon Floating Hotel became a widely celebrated icon of the rise of tourism in Vietnam. Locals affectionately knew the hotel as the floater. Its appeal began to wither in 1997, however, when Vietnam's existing hotels were renovated and many other foreign companies joined the lucrative market. Once more, the hotel owners decided to uproot. They sold the hotel to South Korean Asan, the tourism arm of Hyundai, who again decided to move elsewhere in an attempt to pick up profits. This time, the hotel set sail for the unusual location of North Korea. Renamed to Hotel Hegum Gang, the world's first floating hotel was anchored at the Mount Kumgang tourist region near the heavily guarded DMZ border, which opened in 1998 as a north-south experiment in tourism. At the time, relations between North Korea and South Korea were improving. It was hoped that the hotel might attract tourists from South Korea and help to ease these relations even further. Between 1998 and 2008, the floating hotel was the official venue for the emotional reunion of families divided by the 1950 to 1953 Korean War, where South Korean families could meet their relatives in the North, many of which had not seen their loved ones for over six decades. But in 2008, yet another bad hand was dealt for the aging vessel when a North Korean soldier shot and killed a South Korean tourist at the resort. Seoul quickly ceased all tours in the region. Since then, the once celebrated floating hotel has been eerily silent and rusting at the edge of North Korea without maintenance. However, it remains open to local tourists, and I found a few Google reviews of the hotel that were made recently. In 2019, Kim Jong-un visited the site and criticized the facilities. He claimed that the facilities were, quote, not only very backward in terms of architecture, but looked so shabby as they are not properly cared for. The buildings are just a hodgepodge with no national character at all. He then demanded the demolition of unpleasant facilities and the building of new modern ones. That has yet to happen. The hotel remains in North Korea in Kumgang Port. Using Google Maps, you can still see it. So that was the story of the world's first floating hotel, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. If you haven't subscribed to this channel yet, please consider subscribing. And if you want to support this channel, I've created a page on Patreon with exclusive content arriving soon. Thanks for watching. Until next time, stay safe. Hi, my name is Alec Belmore, and I narrate videos for Sidenote. I've got a channel of my own, and it's called History and Intrigue. You can check that out using the link in the description.